So I mentioned that supervised learning is a curve fitting exercise. And I wanna go a little bit more in detail about that to really drive this point home that different models are just learning a representation of the data. They're not doing anything special and so you shouldn't try to, you know, um, attach special significance to uh, the neurons in a neural net, the trees in a decision tree, or the coefficients in a linear model to think that, you know, one of these representations is clearly better than another. So consider this situation where you've got two predictor variables, um, and on this plot, you know, the x-axis, the variable is x1, and the y-axis reads x2. But imagine that the x-axis is actually heart rate, and the y-axis is respiratory rate. And that your outcome, which is shaded either blue or red, represents some binary outcome like, are you ill? Now, it, you, you, know, you looking at this uh, may be faced with a question if you were given uh, the heart rate and respiratory rate of a new patient, can you determine if they're ill or not? Now, we can see here that if you've got extremes of either heart rate or respiratory rate, that you're probably ill. And if your values are kind of along the average, that you're probably healthy. What would we expect the decision boundary to be separating those individuals who are healthy from those who are ill based on the, the points that I'm showing you on this plot. I would argue that a, a good model is one that could learn a circle-shaped boundary. So if it could draw a circle, um, you know, right in between where that blue points are and where the red points are, I would say that's kind of what I would expect an ideal model to, to learn uh, looking at this data. The other, I think, uh, thing that a good model would be able to do is express some uh, uncertainty about its predictions through kind of probabilistic reasoning. So here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, this is the kind of circle boundary that I would be hoping that a model could learn. And let's say I'm given this point one. And let's say this is a new patient that's not in my training data and not in the test data shown on this page. Is this patient healthy or ill? So I think, you know, even just glancing at this, if red means ill, then this patient definitely looks like they're probably ill, definitely does not look like they're probably healthy, at least based on these two variables. Patient two, on the other hand, uh, resembles healthy patients a lot more than ill patients. So if I had to guess, I would guess that this patient is healthy and that's what I would want a model to guess as well. Patient three, on the other hand, is kind of right along the boundary. And so I would want the model to be able to express that, you know, for patient three, I'm not really sure. They're kind of, uh, you know, halfway between healthy and ill. So, you know, I wouldn't want a model that for patient three is really sure about either possibility, but rather I'd want a model that could say it was uncertain about whether this patient was healthy or ill uh, for patient three based on the you know, training data shown uh, through the blue and red points. So can a decision tree learn this relationship? So this is an example of a decision tree uh, the way a decision tree works is that it uh, learns a representation of the data in which it splits left and right uh, based on the kind of most important variables. So in this decision tree, uh, where it's predict predicting uh, the type of insurance a patient has, whether it's private insurance or not private insurance, uh, whether the patient's age is greater than or equal to 68 is the uh, most important split in making that determination. And in fact, if a patient's age is greater than or equal to 68, then it's pretty much established that that patient is going to have uh, non-private insurance 
probably because they have Medicare. So this just shows you that this is what a decision tree looks like. Uh, many times we actually design these decision trees by hand when we're you know, talking about um, trees that tell us what to do and how to care for certain patients. But these decision trees can be learned automatically from data using algorithms. So can a decision tree model learn this relationship? So using this uh, link at the very bottom, uh, there's a tool called an MLR Playground, which uses the MLR machine learning package to interactively let you uh, fit and evaluate models on kind of these toy examples or toy data sets. And so this is the uh, representation that the decision tree learned uh, for this data set. So where you see blue, it means that it's very sure that this is patient is healthy. Where you see the background color is red, the, the model is very sure that this patient is not healthy. And where you see kind of orange or anything in between like yellow, the model's uncertain. And I would argue that, you know, all things considered, this decision tree model was able to learn this relationship. Um, and this is a fairly simple uh, but useful representation in that we can look at the uh, X1 and X2 variables or uh, what we were saying was heart rate and respiratory rate and quickly come to a determination about you know, which patients are normal and which patients aren't in a way that we could communicate to a uh, person who is, you know, screening these patients. So we could tell them some simple rule, like if X1, uh, which is that X axis is between negative one and one, and X2, which is the Y axis, is between negative 1.5 and about 1.2, then this patient is healthy. Otherwise, you know, we can say that they're probably not healthy. The patient uh, or the model does get some cases wrong because you can see that there are some blue cases which are, or some blue dots that are in the orange or yellow zone. Um, and there are some red dots that are in the orange or yellow zone. So it's not perfect, but you can see how this is a, uh, a fairly simple but possibly useful representation of the data. And the other thing that you'll notice is that this model can express uncertainty very crudely. So there are big chunks of areas where the model is uncertain about what the outcome is. And that's why you see those big blocks of kind of yellowish, orangish color on the left and on the right. What if we put a series of decision trees together uh, and one algorithm in which multiple decision trees are combined is called a random forest model. Can a random forest model learn this relationship? So now you start to see that, you know, this resembles more what we were expecting when we uh, originally envisioned what we thought the boundary would look like. In that, um, well, one, the relationship is a little bit more complicated than a decision tree. It's not just learning a straight box. You can see how there are multiple different boxes here and the area of uncertainty is a lot more round as compared to what we had before and evenly spread along the circle. And so what I'm showing here is a, a combination of 500 decision trees that form a random forest model. In this example, it actually gets all the cases right. But the area of uncertainty, although it's more kind of round than the decision tree I showed you, is still pretty jagged and boxy. So I would say that with this set of parameters, the random forest learns what looks like a better relationship, maybe more useful than what the decision tree learned, but still not what I was envisioning when I first showed you uh, the data set before we had applied a model on it. However, if you change the way that the 
Random Forest chooses uh, its splits. Um, and this process is referred to tuning because we can tune or change different parameters about how the random forest gets trained. In this case, changing the splitting rule to an extra trees rule, which you don't need to know about. I'm just showing you what I did in case you want to try to replicate this on the MLR playground. This makes the area of uncertainty a lot more representative of what I thought it was going to be. So it's a lot more accurate based on what we initially expected based on the data that we had seen. And now the boundary is a lot more round than what we had in that last slide. So yes, a random forest can learn this relationship. In other words, it can fit a curve to learn a curved decision boundary. Can a naive Bayes algorithm learn this relationship? Yes, it can also learn a curve. It learns a nice circular boundary. It does get a handful of cases wrong. You can see a few blue dots sitting in red territory. Um, and it can express uncertainty, but there is a very small area in which it's actually uncertain. So it's, for the most part, either showing data that's you know blue or red, there's a very, very thin ring of yellow where it's uncertain about what the... Um, whether the patient is healthy or ill. What about a support vector machine? Uh, this is another type of machine learning algorithm. Um, in its simplest form, it resembles a logistic regression model in a lot of ways. And so as you can see from the slide, it looks like um, predictions, anything on the kind of bottom right, it's predicting as being healthy and top left is predicting as unhealthy, and that just looks totally wrong um, and not correct. So it seems like from our you know, initial look at this that support vector machines can't learn this relationship. So this is a support vector machine with a linear kernel. That's why it's learning a line. But the data aren't linearly separable. So if we wanted to learn a curve, we either need to change that linear kernel, which I don't expect you to know about. This is an option you can set inside of a support vector machine model or by transforming the underlying data. So let's try changing this kernel from a linear kernel to a radial basis function kernel. And let's see what we get. So now we get basically you know, the perfect boundary that we were expecting. Uh, and so if we apply a different kernel, we otherwise use all the same settings on our support vector machine other than changing this. And I didn't do any transformation to the data prior to fitting this model. The kernel itself does that transformation for you so that you can efficiently um, learn this relationship using a support vector machine. So now the SVM appears to perform well, um, and it has a very small zone of uncertainty as compared to the random forest model, for example, because again, the, that yellow ring of uncertainty is pretty thin. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just illustrating the point that all of these different types of models in the end are learning a relationship of the data that's fairly similar, even if the underlying models look completely different from one another. What about logistic regression? Um, so on first pass, just like that support vector machine model I showed you in the beginning, you might think that there's no way that this data is linearly separable. But it's actually pretty trivial to be able to separate the red points on this slide uh, from the green points using a logistic regression model. And it involves some simple transformations of the data. So imagine that you take x1 and x2 and you replace them with the absolute value for x1 and x2. So I'm just showing x1, x2 equals you know uh, abs x1 and abs x2 
But if you were going to actually apply this to your data set, you would put this statement inside of a mutate function. And if you do that, now um, your green points are pretty easily separable from the red points. And so if you transform the data in this way, a logistic regression model would actually perform very well in separating the red points from the green points. Another option would be that you could replace x1 and x2 with the squared values. And this would again give you a very similar result um, to taking the absolute value um, in that you'd be able to learn uh, uh, a boundary that in this transformed space looks linear, but if you project it back to the original space, might look more like a diamond or kind of more circular. So one model type we haven't covered um, is a neural network. And we're not really gonna dwell on neural networks too much in this course, but um, I did wanna look at this circle problem and see if you know, a neural net could learn this relationship. Um, neural nets are actually not present in the MLR playground, but it turns out that Google has a TensorFlow playground for which you can find the link at the bottom left. And although this um, diagram isn't identical to the one on the previous slide, it's fairly similar, uh, except they have blue points and orange points. And you almost can't even see the orange points because they're completely covered by orange background. Um, but if you look at this, this is basically identical to what we learned previously in the other slides, which is showing how a neural net with two layers, with four neurons in one layer, two neurons in the other layer, is able to learn uh, you know, this appropriate circular decision boundary. So the you know, next question that comes up is, why should we even learn a representation of the data? What I've shown you is, is that all of those different representations are able to fairly readily distinguish which patients are healthy from which patients are not healthy on this very simplistic artificial data set with two predictors and one outcome. But I would argue that we actually don't even need a model to be able to figure out which patients are healthy and which patients are not healthy. So what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is, you know, what it, when I asked you about patients one, two, and three, um, as to whether you thought they were healthy or not, what did you do internally as you were looking at this, uh, you know, image? I can guarantee you didn't build a random forest inside your head to try to separate out, you know, is patient one or two healthy? What you probably did was you looked at patient one and you looked at some of the points that are closest to patient one. And you know a formal way to do that would be to take a ruler and actually measure that distance uh, from patient one to some of its neighbors. And you, know, you could use the Pythagorean theorem to make that calculation. But once you find the closest neighbors, you could see what are the neighbors. And in the case of uh, patient one, the neighbors all appear unhealthy because uh, all the neighboring points are red. So my prediction would be that this patient is also not healthy uh, or is ill. In the case of patient two, all the neighboring dots seem to be blue. So I would again be more likely to say that patient is unhealth or is a healthy. And with patient three, you're really stuck because patient three is kind of equidistant from the blue and the red dots. And so, you know, that uh, patient is why, that's why we were uncertain about what to say about patient three. But this idea of calculating a distance measure from new points uh, with all of the existing data points in a data set, and then picking the you know, uh, making a prediction based on the neighboring points uh, is actually has a name. It's, there's no model there, um, but this is actually known as uh, uh, K nearest neighbors. 
So again, if we want to measure the distance, you could say take you know patient one, look at the difference uh, in x one or on the x-axis between patient one and that and that red hollow point. Take uh, the difference in x two on the y-axis, and then you know take the sum of squares and take a square root, which helps you calculate that distance. Um, and you can basically apply this across all of the data points to find the neighbors. And once you've got the neighbors, you can make a prediction. So if you apply a k-nearest neighbors model um, to this data set, it also learns a pretty nice circular relationship um, along the lines of what we would expect um, based on our initial look at that data. The K in this case refers to the number of neighbors that you look at. Um, so, you know, you could look at just the closest single neighbor. You could look at the closest 10 or 11 neighbors or the closest, you know, 40 neighbors, and that would be your K. In this example, we actually looked at the uh, nearest seven neighbors. Um, and because we picked more than one neighbor, that's why we're able to express uh, areas of uncertainty. So those yellow dots or the, you know, the yellow background represents areas where the, not all of the neighbors were red or blue, but maybe three sevenths of the neighbors were blue and four sevenths were red or vice versa. In many senses, K nearest neighbors is actually not a model. And what I mean by that is that um, when you go to train this model, it takes no time at all, literally no time. There is no underlying representation of the data. To be able to apply a K nearest neighbors model, you actually have to store the entire data set so that when a new point comes along, for which you have to make a prediction, you calculate the distance from that new point to every single existing point you know, uh, on this grid uh, before you can make a prediction. So this is sometimes referred to as a le lazy learning algorithm because there is no, uh, there is no you know, modeling that takes place when you go to fit this model. But again, this just goes to show you that this is yet one more way to represent data, in this case, by using the actual data itself uh, through a set of distance measures that allows you to make predictions about new cases that come along um, by comparing them against the data that you have access to already.